Hello everyone, hello, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Oakham Baptist Church this morning. Now we are beset at the moment with illness throughout Rutland and there's lots of people who are taking the opportunity of kids all finishing exams and schools to get away. So what I want you to do is look around and tell everybody here, I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad you're here today. Yeah, that's it. Uh, no, every single person, everyone, everyone, everyone. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's great that we can be joined here today, this morning. It's wonderful that we can come together and worship God as one family. Just a couple of, a couple of things um, that I want to say before we start. So I want to remind everyone that after the service next week, um, 3rd of July, is that next week? Yes, it is. Um, we will have our church members meeting. So if you are a church member or if you want to know what happens at a church members meeting, then after the service next week, about half 12, after we've had teas and coffees and such things, we'll be having a church members meeting where we're going to be discussing, discussing the future and the vision for the church. So if you're available, please do come along to that. Um, Kathy has got something that she wants to share with us. Morning church, morning those who've managed to come today, morning those of you who are at home struggling with the disease we won't mention. Okay, so uh, we finished the prayer course the last eight weeks on a Wednesday evening, about 12 of us have been meeting to do the prayer course together and it's been just an amazing time and we've explored different ways of praying together and we've learned from each other and we've learned from a video and it's been really good. So for those of you who are now right now thinking, oh I missed it. What a shame. It will run again later this year, so keep, keep a lookout for that. On the back of that, we want to increase the numbers of times that we meet as a church to pray during the week. I know that you've all got personal prayer rhythms, I'm sure, and times when you pray during the day and during the week, but I think it's really important that we meet together as a church as well to pray. We need to be a praying church. So, we already have Tuesday morning at 7.30 on Zoom, details on the church website. Um, we are a small but select group at 7.30 on a Tuesday morning. Uh, it'd be great to see more of you. If you can manage to join us for half an hour before you get on with your day, that would be brilliant. We're going to add in on a Wednesday evening at 9.30 in the evening, 9.30 p.m., an evening prayer for people to gather together and again, pray on Zoom. We won't bring you to church at 9.30 in the evening. So there will be Zoom details for that going out on the church website tomorrow. And also on a Thursday, so all our prayers are going to be midweek, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Thursday, we're going to meet in person at lunchtime, 12 noon in the church. We're going to meet in the room upstairs and we're going to pray together for about half an hour or so every Thursday. And that starts this week. So... Just to remind you, Tuesday, 7.30 in the morning, Wednesday, 9.30 in the evening, Thursday, right in the middle of the day at 12 noon. And I really hope as many of you as possible will be able to join in one of those prayer times, whichever suits your day and how it works. And all the details will go out on the website tomorrow with Zoom details where appropriate. Okay, thanks very much. Awesome stuff. Thank you very much, Cathy. Um, today we are up to Judges 19. Now, Judges 19, if you're familiar, if you've read ahead or if you're familiar with this part of the Bible, is perhaps the most difficult part of the Bible. It contains some very adult themes. So all our children and young people's groups are running today. If you normally have your young people in, just to let you know that there will be adult themes that we talk about and address today. You're welcome for your young people to stay in, but you need to be aware that is the case. And likewise, if you're watching online, just be aware that we will be discussing adult themes throughout the service today. But let's come together in prayer. Lord Father, we want to thank you that you are a God who touches every part of life. 
You're a God who created everything. Nothing is off bounds to you. You know the darkest parts of our heart. And for those things that we've done this week, that we are perhaps ashamed of or we feel guilty of, we hold them before you and say, Father, we recognize this isn't the people you've created us to be, and for that, we are indeed sorry. But you're also the God who shined light into every part of the darkest reach of the world. A light that is all-consuming and shines so bright. Father, shine that light into our lives. We thank you that when we come before you with our darkness, your light shines and we stand totally forgiven in your eyes. Father, thank you that today we gather together as your people, your light-shined people, to praise and worship you together. So every prayer that is said, every amen that is given, every word that is uttered, and every verse that is sung, may they all be a testament to your amazing goodness and the brightness of your light in a dark world. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the music group to come and join us. And this from Psalm 103. It says, Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul. And, for, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. Who satisfies your desires with good things. So that your youth is renewed like the eagles. So let's stand if you are able, if you're comfortable to stand, please do. And let's lift our voices to the Lord together in song.
Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your work to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty. And I will meditate on your wonderful works. groups to be going so Madeline's going to come down and let you know who's going where and how. <laughs> Good morning it's so nice to see so many children here again today and some who haven't been before so welcome if you haven't and um, so it's now time for all the different children's groups to go out so as normal if you're in adventure which is preschool you'll be going out 
the back room as normal. Um, Discover, which is reception to year two, you'll be going upstairs. Again, parents and carers, remember to go up with your child and just make sure that they've been deposited with an adult. <laughs> and explore years three to five, you're going to be registering out in the kitchen, outside the kitchen, and walking across with youth. And youth, you're going to be registering out there as well. So I hope that's clear. And uh, I hope you have a lovely time in your groups. Off you go. as you are, um, come, come to him. He's faithful, he's good, and you can come to him regardless of what your week's been like, regardless of how you feel, regardless of what's going on. Just come as you are. Um, he is faithful and he's good.
my rock. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm. song is so much like um, the book of Judges that we've been going through where so many times we turn to do things on our own and the many times we fall down the storms that come with it and we have to realize that our God is our anchor and turn to him for salvation faithful one you're always so unchanging and ageless one you're my rock of peace Lord of all I depend on you and I call out to you again and again every time I fall Lord I turn to you again and again and you don't turn from me Lord you stay by me and you love me and you're faithful to me Lord you're my rock in times of trouble Lord and you lift me up when I fall down all through the storm your love is the anchor and my hope remains in you Lord God in you alone Amen Save to be 
Yeah, please do take your seats, yeah. Um, however we come before God today, we don't have to be slaves to the things that the world wants to hold us back into because we are children of God, the creator of all, and we stand free, free before him to worship and praise him. So we've had an absolute wonderful, wonderful time, is that? The we've had an informative time going through the book of Judges. Um, I hope you've had a wonderful time too. And so we are now up to um, chapter 19 in the book of Judges. So if you want to reach for your Bibles, if you've got them, if you've not got a Bible, there's some here that I can, well, that dick will hand out, excellent stuff. I don't know if Darren's paused to hand some out or he's after one and he's really keen to get his hands on one. There we go. So we are up to, we're up to 19. So there's also some Bibles at the back if you've not got one. If you're watching at home, then please do turn to your Bibles as well. So if you flick through from the front, Judges is the seventh book that you'll come to. Feel free to use the index at the front. That's always a useful thing to, uh, to do. Seventh, eighth. Um, so we are into Judges 19. So today we're going to be talking about sex again. And I'm just aware that the last four or five times that I've preached, we've talked about sex um, together as a church. Now, there are two different ways that you can go through the Bible as a church. So the first way to go through the Bible as a church is where it's called a thematic approach. So you ask God to put a theme on your heart and then you take the theme that you want to talk about and then you find scripture to match it. So if you take that approach to scripture, you'll find that you'll talk about hope and love and God's saving grace because we want to talk about those things, don't we? It's comfortable, it's nice. The second way to approach scripture, and this is the method that I most definitely always prefer and think is the best method is, oh, that's because I'm too noisy. <laughs> the one I think the best method is where we let God tell us what book of the Bible we want, to, we want him to talk to us from. And then we go from the start through to the end. We look at the topics and the themes that God wants to bring from his scripture rather than telling God what topics and themes we want to explore. So as we go through books of the Bible in that way, we'll find that we talk about two things a lot more than thematic approach as well. The first thing that we'll talk about a lot more than other churches is money. The Bible talks about money a lot. So as you go through books of the Bible, you'll find that you'll talk about money a lot. The reason is, money is always a great judge of how we're living our disciplined Christian lives. What we do with our money, our heart is where our treasure is. The Bible really cares about our discipleship as Christians, as the people of God. So it really cares about what we do with our money as a sign of that discipleship. So you'll end up talking about money a lot. The other thing that you'll end up talking about quite a lot is sex. Because the Bible talks about sex a lot. The reason is, sex is a good um, level to see where the people of God are in terms of how they're living their lives. It's always a great level to see how the world is compared to how God wants it to be. The sexual morality of the world and the sexual morality of the church all the way through the Bible and now into his church, now with the people of God, that line will always show you how far from God's perfect creation the world has got. So that's why we're talking about sex again today because as we're looking at the book of Judges, a book that is tracing the decline of the nation that should be following God, it's going to use sex as that bar as that that level to show us how far down the people of God have come in how they should be living their life. And now at Judges 19, we're right scraping the bottom of that barrel. And so you'll find that this chapter and the one after it will talk about the sexual state of the nation quite a lot. And there's some really adult themes that we're going to explore today. So if you've um, managed by now, hopefully, to find your way to Judges 19, I'm going to first ask Eileen and then Arn and then Carmelita are going to come up and share our reading for the day. Judges chapter 19, the first 10 verses. Now a Levite who lived in a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim took a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But she was unfaithful to him. She left him and went back to her parents' home in Bethlehem, Judah. 
After she had been there four months, her husband went to her to persuade her to return. He had with him his servant and two donkeys. She took him into her parents' home, and when her father saw him, he gladly welcomed him. His father-in-law, the woman's father, prevailed on him to stay, so he remained with him three days, eating and drinking and sleeping there. On the fourth day they got up early and he prepared to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh yourself with something to eat, then you can go. So the two of them sat down to eat and drink together. Afterward, the woman's father said, Please stay tonight and enjoy yourself. And when the man got up to go, his father-in-law persuaded him, so he stayed there that night. On the morning of the fifth day, when he rose to go, the woman's father said, Refresh yourself, wait till afternoon. So the two of them ate together. Then when the man, with his concubine and his servant, got up to leave, his father-in-law, the woman's father, said, Now look, it's almost evening. Spend the night here. The day is nearly over. Stay and enjoy yourself. Early tomorrow morning you can get up and be on your way home. But unwilling to stay another night, the man left and went towards Jabus, that is Jerusalem, with his two saddle donkeys and his concubine. Judges 19, verses 11 to 20. Um, when they were near Jebus, and the day was almost done, the servant said to his master, Come, let us stop at this city of the Jebusites and spend the night. His master replied, No, we won't go into any city whose people are not Israelites. We will go on to Gibeah. He added, Come, let's try to reach Gibeah or Ramah and spend the night in one of those places. So they went on, and the sun set as they neared Gibeah in Benjamin. There they stopped to spend the night. They went and sat in the city square, but no one took them in for the night. That evening, an old man from the hill country of Ephraim was living in Gibeah. The inhabitants of the place were Benjamites, came in from his work in the fields. When he looked and saw the traveller in the city square, the old man asked, Where are you going? Where did you come from? He answered, We are on our way from Bethlehem in Judah to a remote area in the hill country of Ephraim, where I live. I have been to Bethlehem in Judah, and now I am going to the house of the Lord. No one has taken me in for the night. We have both straw and fodder for our donkeys and bread and wine for ourselves, your servants, me, the woman, and the young man with us. We don't need anything. You are welcome at my house, the old man said. Let me supply whatever you need. Only don't spend the night in the square. So he took him into his house and fed his donkeys. After they had washed their feet, they had something to eat and drink. I'm reading from Judges 19, verse 22 to 29. While they were enjoying themselves, some of the wicked men of the city surrounded the house, pounding on the door. They shouted to the old man who owned the house, bring out the man who came to your house so we can have sex with him. The owner of the house went outside and said to them, no, my friends, don't be so vile. Since the man is my guest, don't do this outrageous thing. Look, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. 
I will bring them out to you now, and you can use them and do to them whatever you wish. But don't do such an outrageous thing. But the men would not listen to him. So the man took his concubine and sent her outside to them, and they raped her and abused her throughout the night. And at dawn, they let her go. At break day, the woman went back to the house where her master was staying, fell down at the door and lay there until daylight. When her master got up in the morning and opened the door of the house and stepped out to continue his way, they laid his concubine, fallen, they laid his concubine, fallen in the doorway of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, get up, let's go. But there was no answer. Then the man put her on his donkey and set out for the out for home. When he reached home, he took a knife and cut up his concubine limp by limp into 12 parts and sent them into all areas of Israel. Everyone who saw it was saying to one another, such a thing has never been seen or done, not since the day the Israelites came out of Egypt. Just imagine, we must do something. So speak up. So yeah, Judges 19, possibly one of the hardest scriptures in the Bible. Something that just shows us the length that Israel's depravity has indeed got to shows us the very worst of humanity that there ever has been. Now, as I was reading through this, I saw seven major things that we're going to talk about and bring to light today. Now, if you're, if you're a fan of biblical numerology, which I know many of you are, then you will know that seven is the biblical number that often represents perfection in God's eyes. So how ironic here that there are seven major things that show the depravity of humanity. So the first one is this. This is about the Levite. So just to explain what a Levite is, and we talked about it a little bit last week, week before last. So a Levite are um, the descendants of Aaron, and they're called to be a holy priesthood. The rest of Israel is supposed to support them with land and with food and with finances, so they could always be about the business of attending to the worship of God. So here is this, this Levite, and we don't know anybody's name through the course of this scripture. So this anonymity that's in place serves two reasons. Firstly, the anonymity helps us to see that each one of these people aren't individual, but they stand for a whole section of society. The Bible always uses anonymity in that form. And the second reason it does it is because it tries to dehumanize the characters that are there, to stay in line with the dehumanization of God's created people that is happening through the book of Judges. So this Levite, this holy person of God, firstly we read that he's living in the land of, of Ephraim, in the hill country of Ephraim, which shows us that the people of God are not supporting him in the way that they should because he's been allocated towns where he's supposed to live. And the hill country is not one of them. But out of all the people in Israel, surely this holy man of God should be the person who is following God. And showing a way that other people should live. But here is our first issue. He takes for himself a concubine. Now, to explain what a concubine is, a concubine was often uh, somebody who um, would be seen as property that the man would own for sexual pleasure or for serving them in whatever they wanted. Normally, you'd have a wife and then you'd get a few concubines as well to suit your needs. Now, the Levite is not loving this woman as he should. So lots of people, normally people who have never read the Bible, will tell you that the Bible is very anti-woman and it's very um, chauvinist and it's very misogynist. 
rubbish. It's not. It's the complete opposite of that. At a time where in culture at that time, where women were seen as property that could be traded, that were owned, that were not even second class, but in some cultures lower than the animals that would tend the fields, the Bible speaks directly against that and says, men and women are equal and are called to love and protect each other. So in Exodus twenty two sixteen, we read that if you lie with a woman, you therefore shall marry her. So the Bible is saying that you've got to be careful because if you sleep with a virgin, you are called to marry that woman. And when you marry that woman, you have to love her, protect her. You become one flesh together. So therefore, you shall treat each other as yourselves. You are one flesh. The Bible supports the rights of women at a time where the rest of society did not. So don't believe the rubbish that you'll hear that the Bible is not supportive of women. It is so countercultural. It's unbelievable. It's easy to read it with our eyes now and see the differences and say it's not. It was. Particularly at the time when this was written, this would have been so countercultural to the rest of society around the area. So this Levite, this holy man of God, he knows his scriptures. He knows Exodus bet off the back of his hand. He's been reciting these scriptures since he was able to read and talk. Yet he knows he's supposed to take this woman and make her his wife, but he doesn't. He has her as a concubine, a plaything. Something that will keep him, but he has no need to support. The people of God are called to treat each other with compassion, love and equity at every single point in life. So that's our first issue with the Levite. The second issue is we read that the concubine is then unfaithful to the Levite. And there's no way about it. The, the words that are used here means that she was sexually unfaithful to him. And therefore she runs away to go and live with her, with her father. Now, I'm going to put it out there. This Levite is a bad person, right? You've heard the scripture. He's a bad guy. He's a bad guy. It's not like he was a complete loving person and she's been unfaithful and fled and he's in any good light whatsoever. He's not. He's an awful bad guy. He's, he's uncompassionate. He's coercive, manipulative, controlling. He's unfaithful himself. He's got concubines. He's neglectful. The fact that he waits four months before he goes to find out where she is and what's happened to her. So don't get me wrong. This Levite is an awful, awful example of humanity. But two wrongs never make a right. Adultery, we've talked about this a few weeks back, is never the answer. It's the answer to one question, and that's what shall I never do? So he goes and he gets her from her father's house. And after a bit of a delay where her father is probably worried about the fact she's going to go back off with this Levite, he, he ends up traveling for, for home. And they stop um, the, the night's drawing in. It's very, very uh, dangerous to travel at night back then along the, um, along the roads. So they decide that they're going to stop. But the Levite says he doesn't want to stop where, uh, in a city that isn't inhabited by the people of God. Because if he stops at somewhere where there aren't people of God, that's going to be really dangerous. Oh, the irony. I hear you sigh. So they go past Jebus, which is, which is later known as Jerusalem. Um, so they don't stop there. and They decide to stop at a city called Gibeah, which was part of the tribe of Benjamin. The whole of Israel was split up into different sections, almost like counties. So this was the county, if you want, of, of Benjamin. And the city is Gibeah. Now, he's sat in the city square and they're waiting. And this is where the third bad thing happens. There is no hospitality available for them. Now, in Eastern culture... That would have been absolutely shocking that they were sat in the city square and nobody took them in. Even more shocking with the people of God who were told to welcome the stranger, to bring the guest into your home because you were once guests and strangers in the land of Egypt. Those who were constantly told that by bringing in guests, they're entertaining angels and they'll get God's blessing. To leave people outside like this is a huge issue. The people of God shouldn't be doing it. But why exactly were they doing it? Well, I'd like to say that they probably knew what was going to happen. The fact that the only person who would take them in from the city, from the city center was a foreigner to the region who'd only just got there shows us that they were perhaps fully knowing 
and worried about what was going to happen. And after this man has taken in the guests, this is where there is a rapid decline in our narrative. So those who are familiar with the previous um, books of the Bible, no doubt when reading this would have seen some um, allusion towards Genesis 19 and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's very deliberately a parallel of that story. So in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, um, two angels have gone to the city and they're waiting in the, in the city center and no one will take them in. Then Lot goes out. So Lot's a nephew of Abraham. He goes and he takes in these angels into his house and the people of Sodom, they come and they bang on the door and they demand that Lot lets these angels out so they can have sex with them. And Lot says, I'll send my two virgin daughters and you can do whatever you want to them. And as he's gathering his daughters to send them out, the angels blind everyone who is outside and then take Lot and his family and get them away and then de completely destroy all but one of the cities on that plain where those cities were. This is a deliberate parallel of that story, except in this story, there are no angels around to save the day. And this is where we hit our fourth big issue of sexual morality that is being highlighted for us. And that is the act here in this of homosexuality. Now, I don't care what your um, views on it now currently are of same-sex marriage. We can talk about that, we can debate it, but here in this narrative, in this narrative in Judges 19, it is being used as a very sinful act. That's why, for example, these people in verse 22 are called wicked. That's a literal translation, sons of Belial, sons of Satan. And the, the, the old man says, don't be so vile. That word vile is saying... Don't be so disgraceful. He says, this thing you're trying to do is completely outrageous. It's vile. Don't do it. Here in this narrative, this is a negative thing and a sinful thing that is being talked about. And this leads on to our fifth big issue that happens in this chapter. The old man offers out his daughter and the concubine of the Levite. And it was at this point where I was reading it, I was saying, do these people mean so little that he's willing to usher them out the door to a baying mob? To say to them, use them and do to them whatever you wish, whatever is right in your own eyes. Again, back to that refrain that we are reading now throughout these latter parts of Judges. There was no king in Israel. Everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Do to them as you please. Whatever you want is good for me. Now, I've got four children. If there was a baying mob outside, intent on rape and murder, would I throw my daughter outside? Would you throw your daughter outside in the hope that this baying mob would then leave you alone? That's how little the life of his daughter and the life of this Levite's concubine mean to this old man. And then we hit possibly the um, climax of this chapter. Sent, the concubine is thrown outside where she is then raped. The Levite takes her, throws her out to this bay and mobbed, and she's gang raped all through the night until dawn breaks in the morning. No one helps. She screams in the city and no one comes to her aid. People close windows, close doors, despite the heat of the day. And pretend that they haven't heard the cries. There's a thing called bystander effect. So in, the, um, in New York in 1964, there was a, a girl called Kitty Genoese. And she was raped and murdered in front of a big crowd of people. But nobody stepped in to help. Despite the fact that there were people there watching, she was murdered and nobody came forward to help this 28-year-old lady. So 
Um, Latane and Dani, uh, two social psychologists, did some research into this, into the, the reasons why. And they decided that there were two reasons why bystander effect, bystander effect happens. And it happens very often in our society. People will stand around and watch a heinous act happening and won't get into help. The two reasons were diffusion of responsibility. They reason that and they prove that when there's more people around, less people will help. When there's lots of people, people think that what they can do how much they can intervene and their worth in this situation is less and little. So diffusion of responsibility. And the second one is this, social influence. They said that the behavior that's happening around us will always dictate what we do. Even if our strong morals say that's not right, but no one else is bothered. Oh. It's called social influence. Our actions are dictated by the actions of those around us. Which just shows us the absolute rock bottom state that the people of God are in. That this rape is ignored. And then we get on to the seventh. And this is perhaps the most callous and horrid thing that happens in this story. Even more, I think, perhaps than the rape itself. So this Levite, who was originally called, remember, to love this woman as his own flesh... This Levite goes to sleep. And then he wakes up in the morning, gets on his merry way, opens the door, and almost trips over this concubine's body. Lying there on the floor. Does he help her? Does he pick her up? Does he heal her? Does he hug her, tend to her wounds? Does he try to comfort her? Does he tear his garments in two? That happens quite often in the Old Testament. And cry out for vengeance to the Lord who says he will avenge all wrong? No. Her bloody, savaged, beaten, broken body. He simply takes it, it, and throws it onto the back of his donkey and goes. Rides off. On the journey which he has been inconvenienced on so far. And that difference between one and seven. That first sin we read about and this seventh horrible callous act. Really shows us the difference in what the people of God are called to do. And what they were doing. The fact that he was called to love this woman as his own flesh. He was called to give his life to her. To the point where he just chucks her on a donkey. And rides off. Was she dead? We're not quite sure. Verse 28 just tells us that there was no noise that came from her. Now the chances are, and most scholars will say, she probably wasn't dead at this point. The Bible is normally quite clear, and it tells us when somebody is dead. It's a very meaningful thing for the Old Testament Hebrew writers to tell us when there's been a transition of life from life to death. And it doesn't say, so she, she may not have been, but I don't want to read into this and lay murder at the feet of this guy who's already got so much laid there. But he chops up her body, alive or dead chops up her body and sends off the pieces to the 12 different tribes, the 12, 12 different counties of the nation. How far we've come, in our we've come in our story of Judges. To think all those weeks ago when we looked at Judges 1 and 2, and the worst thing that the people of God were doing was bowing down to other idols. They were worshipping someone other than God, and in... 16 chapters later, here we are now, with these seven, possibly eight, horrendous, horrible, disgusting acts. But that is always the trajectory that life will follow when it is separate from God. God created all, and he looked at it and said, it's good. It's perfect in my sight. The only thing that's ever going to happen when God is not reigning over that creation is it will move down from perfection and that trajectory will go one way. Look at the world now, the world around us. 
full of adultery, full of coercive relationships, full of rape, full of murder. Do you know that there's, uh, there's 650 homicides in the UK a year? That's two a day. You hear about them on the news? Do you know that there's 675,000 reported cases of rape a year in the UK? Hear about them on the news? This week, Mick. 12 year old girl. How far we've come. The fact that you remember it and hear about it means it's the one thing that's hit the headlines. And the people of God are sliding that way too. Look at the ethics of the church worldwide. Particularly here in the West. They're on a downward trajectory. No longer the holy people of God. But somewhere between that and society. And when the church, when the people of God, the gathered people. Track that downward trajectory of society. It's troubling times for all. Jody and I watched the, uh, the Batman, the new Batman film last week. Well, a few days ago. We watched Batman. So do you know at the start of all the Batman films... And before the first credits roll, there's always a scene of the lawlessness of Gotham. There'll be like a montage of all these people doing terrible things and you're waiting. You're waiting for the Cape Crusader to descend or come out of the shadows with vengeance. And you're watching it and you see this lawless state of the city. And I remember the first Batman film I watched. So, Arnie as Mr. Freeze. Uh, Batman and Robin. Is that right? He looks around. Batman and Robin, sort of like 97, I think it was. And I remember watching that, and I saw that depraved state of Gotham, and I thought, could you imagine if it was that bad? With every subsequent Batman film, it seemed a little bit more realistic. Until the point where we were watching the Batman a few days ago, and I just thought it was a documentary about nightlife in London. That's how depraved the world is getting. Where these things that were shown as these huge, massive... Issues in society. Don't let the world get that far. It seems quite normative now. And it's not so unrealistic. How do we reverse this trend? This ever decreasing downward spiral? If we read through the rest of the Bible. We'll see that Judges leads us on to a time of Samuel the prophet, where Saul is made king, and then eventually King David comes and rules. And we start to see this upward trajectory, rather than this downward one, where the whole of the nation falls on its knees and starts to return to God. Because the hope of reversal will never happen with society on its own. It's only Jesus that can bring that reversal. And it starts with us, with the people of God, with the church. In the, in the uh, 1700s, England was in a state, a similar crippled, depraved state. And then there was revival through the work of John Wesley and the Methodists. There was a huge revival that preached holiness and a better way of living. And then trajectory started going up. If we want reversal, we need revival. If we want reversal, we need revival. There's no way for that to happen unless we have revival. And it starts with you, the people of God. It starts with the church. It starts with prayer. It starts with repentance. It starts with looking at society around and saying, no more. No more. There's a better way to live. There's an upward trajectory from this bottom, depraved state of the world. And it happens by turning to Jesus. We'll read this from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 5. It says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciles us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. 
And he has committed to us that message of reconciliation. For we therefore, we therefore are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us. If you ask me what church is about, if you say to me, Tom, what is the mission of Oakham Baptist Church? Nay, what is the mission of church? Big C Church, the body of Christ in the world, it's that. It's the ministry of reconciliation. It's looking at the way that God created this perfect world to be. It's looking at the state of the world now and saying, let's get it back up there. The ministry of reconciliation. When we're talking to people about Jesus, we're not introducing a new concept because we've all been created by God. We're just so far gone, we can't quite see it. The ministry of reconciliation. We're reconciling the broken world back up to the place it should be. Your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. The ministry of reconciliation. What are we about here at Oakham Baptist Church? Reconciling Rutland to the kingdom of God. That's it. Simply reconciling Rutland to the kingdom of God. How do we do it? That's the question, isn't it? How do we do it? We show that there is hope in the name of Jesus. We show that no matter how somebody thinks they are lost, no matter the darkness that somebody thinks they are sat in, we show that there's hope in Jesus. We show that no matter how many shadows have overcome a person, there is always a light that will break through the darkness. There's always a light that cannot be overcome by the darkness and it will always shine. There is always hope in Jesus. No matter how low life is, there's always hope in Jesus. There's always a new life in Jesus. My life was rock bottom. I was caught in a world of drugs. I was caught in a world of sexual sin and immorality. I was caught in a desperation and despair. But there's always that hope in Jesus. There's always that light. There's always a new hope and a new life that we can have. Now you may be, you may be trapped in a dark place at the moment. There may be things of your past that are echoing through your life. The sins of the fathers and the, and the grandfathers that echo through life, that affect us, the ripples moving across the sea. You may be in that place of desperation. You may be in that place of pain. Perhaps you've not yet seen that light of Jesus and you're trapped in that box of despair. Perhaps you have given your life to Jesus and yet that despair still keeps coming and keeps overwhelming. There is freedom in Jesus. There is hope in Jesus. There is a light that will shine through the darkness and a light that will break through. God wants to reconcile this broken, fallen world back to himself and we as Christ's ambassadors, are called to bring that hope to the world around us and show the hope that is there. I'm going to ask Rob to come, and Rob is going to share with us a story about uh, his testimony. It's not a story, it's his testimony about that pain, that darkness, that despair that was there, and then how the light of Christ broke through. And after that, we're going to spend some time in prayer. But Rob, I'm going to ask you to come up and share that, brother. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm just going to share a little bit about um, what brought me to God. I uh, just want to start by saying a little bit about myself. My name's Rob, and I'm one of 10 children who grew up in the 1970s. Life was fairly hard as um, dad was a gardener and mum was a homemaker. So we were never rolling in money. Although I lived in hand-me-down clothes and make do amends, we were never short of love. We could never afford holidays, so we were pleased offered to take us out on days out to the seaside. It was usually Skegness. Now, being 
somebody who was liked and trusted by my mum and dad. He lived just four doors away. Being my he always remembered my birthday, bringing a card, presents, and usually a chocolate cake. Mum always used to prepare a tea on the closest Sunday to my birthday and always invite me. I knew that I loved football. And at this time I was a Liverpool fan. <laughs> but God knows I'm a sinner because he's got me as a Villa supporter now. <laughs> um, one evening, I knocked on our door and asked whether I wanted to go around his house to watch a question of sport. Because he knew mum and dad always watched Coronation Street. I did go round his house and was, again was treated to cake and squash. He was very affectionate and always gave loads of cuddles. And after question of sport, I went home and went to bed. A few days later, I knocked again. I told my mum and dad he brought me some clothes and I needed to go to his place and try them on. I did so and on this occasion, I was sexually abused. Being nine or ten at the time, I wasn't fully aware of what was going on. Unfortunately, at different times, the abuse happened again about another ten or fifteen times. I was scared and confused, not fully aware of what was going on. I got to the stage, it, it got to the stage where mum would say that he wanted to see me. He had something for me. I used to pretend that I knocked on his door and that he wasn't there. As I grew a little older, I started to resent him. I remember starting secondary school, and as the year went on, it seemed that everybody apart from me had a girlfriend or boyfriend. The confidence was totally knocked out of me. Fast forward to 1994, I met a beautiful redhead who's now my wife. We started a relationship, but I never found it easy to get intimate because of the pain and trauma of the past. We had loads of discussions as something like this could also knock a spouse's confidence. I decided to have therapy and as recently as six years ago, I was still being counselled by Peterborough Rape Crisis. Tracy was introduced to God by people that she worked for, Graham and Karen Dunn. I didn't really understand what this God thing was all about until I noticed the change in Tracy. She always had a smile on her face and a spring and a step. And she said she started to feel different since recognising God. I had many meetings with my now great friend, friend Graham Dunn, and many dis discussions about my past. Graham prayed and prayed, and after a while, I too started to feel different. I started to give my life to God, and it is one of the best things I've done. God truly does turn lives around, even though he never promises that a walk with him is going to be easy. Tracy and myself have both carried so much baggage, and I'm sure she won't mind me telling you this, that if it wasn't for God, I don't think we'd be married now. I still struggle now, as I know God is commanding me to forgive God but I'm truly finding it difficult, but hopefully I soon will, just so I can let go of my past. God is truly my rock. I just, there's uh, just a couple of things that were speaking to me, so I'm literally just gonna read the first two verses of Psalm 116. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Cheers, Tom. Thank you, Rob, for your courage and your bravery. Um, and hopefully that encourages so many people. There are so many of us whose lives are affected by sexual assault, by rape, by things that have happened in our past or in our families. And there's a God who wants to restore all things and reconcile all things, but it's not easy. It's not easy. We, have a, we run a wonderful um, course through the church called Freedom in Christ, where we look to hold those things before Jesus and work through some of those things, and it's not easy. 
if freedom in Christ is something that would be good for you, if it's something that you'd like to do, then speak to me, speak to Richard Lynn Greasley. We're just finishing off a course now, but we'll be looking to do another one um, after the summer holidays as well. If that's something that you'd like to access, then please do. What I'd like to do now is, there's so many of us whose these, these things have affected, either personally or to our loved ones. What I'd like to do now is take some time of silent prayer to offer you the opportunity to offer these things up to God, to hold these things before him, and pray for each other for the strength and courage that comes in trying to reconcile this broken life and this broken world to the goodness of God. So let's spend five minutes and then um, when the worship team feel that it's right, please do come up and um, lead us through song.
So the band are going to play us out to finish the service in a moment. But I want to encourage you, if anything we've talked about today has um, this impact in your life and you want to talk about it, then the church is open through the week other than Tuesdays and Saturdays. Do just come on in, drop me a message, give the church a call. Don't hold it on your own. Let's hold it together in prayer before God. That's what we're called to do as brothers and sisters. After the service, there's going to be tea and coffee served through here. Please do stay in conversation and spend some time together. If you want me after the service that I'm around, just grab hold of me. Until we gather together again, may the Lord bless us as we embark on our mission of reconciling this county of Rutland back to the kingdom of God. In all we do, say and are. Amen. And I will trust in you alone and i will trust in you